Loud and Quiet presents Midnight Chats. No bullshit. Those were the first two words that came to mind when I was thinking about tonight's guest on Midnight Chats. That's how I describe it, and I mean that as the highest possible compliment, someone who says exactly how she feels. Last week, I met up with Shirley Manson. Just the night before, the Garbage Front Woman had been presented with the Icon Award at this year's VO5 NME Awards, and that's exactly what she is, an icon, and she's been doing her iconic thing for three decades now. On stage at the ceremony in London, Jenny Beth from Savages gave her the statue and to be honest I couldn't put it any better than she did on the evening. Shirley Manson she said is a woman with grace and strength through every stage of her life and career who taught me that I know that I can do and be whoever I want. The next day before she stepped on a plane to travel back to her home in Los Angeles we recorded this conversation and we got into a lot um more than any other midnight chat I can remember. Apart from the awards night, we spoke about her recollections of meeting Marquis Smith from The Fall, who recently passed away. She does a great impression of him, by the way. The lack of opportunities uh, for and the coverage of women in music, particularly older women in music. The Me Too campaign and the current global conversation around gender inequality and just how much more that has to be done on that front. Being a British citizen living in Donald Trump's America as well. And a lot of other stuff too. I should also say that this is a special one for me. This year, 2018, Garbage will celebrate the 20th anniversary of their album version 2.0. And that's got great memories for me. I didn't mention this when I met up with Shirley, but my first ever gig was Garbage at Wembley Arena when they were touring that album. I went with my big brother and his mate. My parents dropped us off and waited around the corner in the local TGI Fridays. And I remember the gig being amazing, um, exceptionally loud. And and I've been to a lot of shows since, but I'll definitely never forget that one. So a real hero of mine on this episode of the podcast, an artist who's passionate, fearless and inspiring. This is Shirley Manson of Midnight Chats. Shirley Manson, welcome to Midnight Chats. Thank you very much. Um, fresh from winning an Icon Award at this year's Enemy Awards, that was last night. How? Congratulations. Thank you. How was your evening? We had fun. It was fun. You know, it was uh, surreal and and sweet, and you know, it was cool to be in, in a room full of musicians that I admire, and mm-hmm. uh, to be part of that community is a privilege, I think. So yeah, it was great. Was it an opportunity to meet any old friends or meet any or make any new acquaintances? What 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 did the evening entail? Yeah, I mean, we bumped into some old pals, some old enemies, um, met some new fabulous people. But yeah, it was great. Jenny Beth from Savages presented you with your award. I thought her words were fantastic. Yeah, you and me both. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, isn't it? What's the feeling like when you're sat at the table, you're about to pick up an award and somebody who no doubt you're a fan of and, and you admire um, says something incredibly heartfelt uh, about you personally and you're just, were you kind of like, you know, were you like, oh, stop being so nice? What was, what was going through your mind just before you walked up to grab the award? I don't know. I mean, I love Jenny Beth. I've had the pleasure of being on her podcast before. So we've spoken, although we, I'd never actually met her mm. in the flesh, but I love her band Savages and... I think she's extraordinary. And so, yeah, to hear her speak like that was m- m- moving. I was really moved by it, you know, because I could tell it was sincere. And I think that's what was so lovely about it for me and my family. And, you know, my brother-in-law was crying and it was really sweet. And I'm very grateful to her. I thought it was a really generous introduction she gave me. She didn't need to do that, you know. For people that haven't seen it yet, Jenny Beth um, spoke very 
eloquently about the influence that you've had on her and said that you know you, you helped give her the confidence to be somebody who really didn't give a fuck about just following her own path and doing what she wanted to do is, is that something that real means a lot to you to hear somebody else say that well I wouldn't say it means a lot to me per se because obviously my career has been about me and my pursuit I mean it's mm. not like I've gone out my way to sort of influence anyone or try and wield influence over anyone I've just tried to be my be as close to my authentic self as I can possibly be um and have a clear conscience and a clean career you know but obviously when you are an artist in the public eye you inadvertently influence people that's just part of the job it goes with the territory when people that you admire whose careers you have followed and and whose work you love then it it, it does mean something more significant I guess and and it's it's exciting and it's and again it's part of that real privilege of being a part of the musical community you know where we're all influencing one another and yeah very special you obviously gave an acceptance speech when you picked up the award had you planned well ahead what you were going to say did you did that kind of come off the top of your head <laughs> the things that you wanted to say I'm ashamed to say I, I had to wing it because it just felt silly to sit down and write a speech for the NME awards like Oscar and, style <laughs> yeah I just I tried to to sort of sit down and think of something I wanted to say and any time it just seemed too heavy handed and or not heavy handed enough you know so I just gave up in the end and just thought I'll wing it much the concern of my husband uh but you know I, I spoke from the heart and I think I did an okay job how does it feel to be given an award that sort of labels you as an icon well it's ridiculous and wonderful at the same time you know I mean I'd be a liar if I said it, it wasn't thrilling, you know, especially coming from the NME, which I, I spoke about last night, broke garbage in the UK or certainly helped to, played a big role in our career, um, was essentially my music bible from the age of 14 onwards. And I learned a lot about music in the pages of, of the broadsheet um, NME. And, you know, I fell in love with a lot of the journalists that we had the pleasure of working with and... I felt legitimised, I guess. It feels like, oh, I am actually a legitimate musician. And that feels cool. Also in the evening, there was um, Brick Smith Start had some very eloquent words to say about Marky Smith. What did you think of, of that moment? Was Marky Smith somebody you were a fan of? Yeah, I was a big Fall fan and had the pleasure of meeting him. Actually, he came and, came and attended one of our shows in Brixton Academy, of all places, ironically. And uh, we were all very excited to meet him and... <laughs> upon being introduced to him he said watching your show tonight was like watching paint dry <laughs> and all of our faces kind of fell you know but it was such a beautiful classic Marky e. Smith comment you know that I think we were all understanding of the fact that we just got we just got a moment right yeah. there and I was very sad to see to read of his passing and I actually met Bricks last night and she had a big effect on me too when I was growing up and you know her and Kim Gordon were like two of the baddest meanest coolest girls in rock and roll as far as I was concerned a couple of years ago at the enemy awards and um, the godlike genius award went to Blondie I was there that night Debbie Harry you've toured with Blondie quite recently in fact what was she like I mean my love of Deborah Harry is is well documented not just because of her contribution to music and and being someone I've looked up to for what almost seems to amount to the whole of my life at this point but to tour with her was extraordinary you know to see a woman of 71 years old still have vigor and purpose and be creative and uh curious is inspiring you know I'm 51 myself and I am often the oldest woman in the room and it can often be a little uh dispiriting because there's not many of us at this level at that age mm -hmm. um, and so you're always the odd one out the the weirdo in the corner and to then go on tour with Debbie I was forced to re sort of change my mind about a lot of my own sort of assumptions about who I am and what, what my age means and so on and so forth and I'm very grateful to her to, that she creates this incredible beacon not just for music women in music but for all women all over the world to, she's standing up saying you can still have agency at 71 that's a powerful message mm -hmm. and it's not a message we really have, have received up until this point you know it's still very very rare for women over 50 to ever be covered by any news 
media outlet, you know. Mm -hmm. And so she's really creating a template as we speak, you know, for all, and and showing us the possibilities. And I'm very grateful to her for that, you know. And I have a lot of love in my heart for her because she's she's not just incredible; she's really kind and generous, and she makes room for everybody in in her you know orbit and not many stars do that at that level have you thought about how long you'd like to continue making music and that, did, it make, <laughs> did that make you think hey yeah i could definitely be still touring with garbage when i'm in my 70s well yes and no you know i mean that's that's what i was saying it changes your perspective when you, you i mean i've said this so much this week but you can become what you see if you don't see any representation of yourself out there i think you feel a little disengaged but when you see someone like her of course that changes your perspective it's like oh I can do this I, and if I want to I will representation has been obviously a big topic certainly around award ceremonies in the arts this year this last couple of years but particularly kind of hot topic at the moment given what's just happened at the Grammys and the head of the Grammys and his comments was it important to when you're offered an award like the Icon Award at the Enemy Awards to accept it? Was that part of your you know reasoning for wanting to go? Yeah, definitely, I'll be there. I'll I'll accept that award. Yeah, I, because I mean, you look back at history, not just in music, but in all aspects of our culture. Women have had a hard time being remembered. They they don't play a large role in the narrative at all. It's almost as though they didn't exist. You know, I believe that that has to change and I, I feel like by accepting certain awards or accolades you are forcing the narrative to cover women mm -hmm. and I believe in that strongly you know because I I feel it inspires other women they see the possibilities for them and so yeah I, I believe that women when given the opportunity should um, accept any accolades coming their way but you know it's all individual choice but that's what I believe in. We yet to see I think a really powerful speech or kind of comment from from a man using that platform to kind of to support for example the Me Too movement uh, or certainly that I've seen perhaps it has happened but um, that's something that important that's something that's important that needs to happen isn't it? Uh, yeah I mean again there's a lot of uh, disagreement amongst women about this but I personally believe that this is not actually a female topic this is a male topic mm -hmm. that women are choosing to speak out on but the midden is male like I mean there's just no doubt about it you look at the statistics you hear women testify this is a male issue and how do we tackle that and the fact that most males are not actually engaging in any sympathetic, empathetic, sensitive, thoughtful fashion surprises me and disappoints me. Mm. Um, it's almost as though men think, well, this is just an entirely female topic. I'm staying out of it and this is not my problem. Well, actually, no, this really is a, it's a male problem. Mm. And it's one in three women are suffering at the hands of male aggression. One in seven men. That's an crazy statistic and what are we going to do about it as as a, as not just a nation as a globe this is a bizarre systemic institutionalized horror story and it amazes me that men are just choosing to look away it's been had plenty of coverage the comments from um the, the head of the, the grammys following this year's awards or rather just before this year's awards and the controversy around that the brit awards have this year have decided to give out the white rose to like everybody that's coming along to this year's awards to show support for the Me Too movement. There's been a lot of debate the last kind of like 24 hours since they announced that because every man that sat on a table at the Brit Awards this year is going to get given one of these things and it feels like possibly it should be, if they want to show support, they should actually be getting off their backsides and doing that by their own volition, not because somebody's just handed their one. What do you think about that? I mean, I would tend to agree that it seems a little pointless. Anyone can shove a white rose on their jacket it doesn't speak to who they are what they are what they believe in how they conduct themselves in their you know in their lives I mean I think we all saw that with the Golden Globes there was a bunch of men men wearing times up pins and then literally 24 hours later were, <laughs> were revealed as as uh, you know predators or or men who are not treating women particularly well mm -hmm. so I guess yeah I want to see action now at this point I think I think we know we have all the evidence we need now now it requires action 
But the actions, unfortunately, are complicated and complex, and I don't know where we begin. I mean, it really requires a very serious analysis by governments all over the world mm. with regards to how do we re-educate young boys and young women? Mm. How do we re-educate our children mm. so that this this stops? We'll never stop it entirely because there, there are sexual predators out there in the world. And I, I don't think any form of education will ever necessarily change that. But the, we can definitely minimise and the sort of bizarre, casual touching and assaulting of, of women. It's funny because I was thinking the other day, you know, as human beings, we are powerful and we're taught children are powerless and we respect that that sort of equation. Generally speaking, adults, and obviously there's always horrifying abnormalities to any story, but in general, adults respect the powerlessness of children and they attend to that and they protect children and men are generally physically stronger than women and they have to be educated to respect that dynamic that equation and at this point i don't think any effort has been put into teaching men how to control themselves how to accept a refusal uh, yeah it's complicated man it's, i don't have any of the answers i just want it to stop yeah i i, I agree i think there's um there's a lot to be done when it comes to education and you, and you immediately think of what can be done in in order to make that stop from the generation that's about to begin. But I think there's also a responsibility on the generation absolutely right now. All uh, all, all, all levels, I think there's there's action that can be taken. Of course, but um, whether it will be uh, is open to debate. To you know, I mean, it's a, such a big problem too with regards to how governments currently view our societies you know when money becomes king people become nothing and when people are nothing they don't put in any money into education and we just sort of fall into this endless pit of you know economics and poverty and excess and <laughs> it's mm. just it's and and I and to me I think if I was if I was a president of a government I would want to encourage more and more money being put into education education is so key and yet money you know everybody only cares about money and profit and of course you can't you can't have profit in education education isn't about profit and it never will be and so I mean I look at the American government they put less and less money into education every day it's astounding mm. you know half they're like one of the most powerful nations richest nations in the world and their and their their education system is falling behind some less well developed countries you know it's just bizarre and ultimately if you have an uneducated populace your whole world is going to go down the toilet really fast mm. certainly doesn't feel very um forward thinking no um, also how has it felt you're a resident in the u.s there's obviously been unarguably a lot of regressive stuff going on in the u.s given the current president um, <laughs> that's, that's putting it incredibly lightly remain isn't it nameless. yeah we actually so the last podcast uh the last episode of the podcast we spoke to casey spooner from fisher spooner who um who refused to say his name because he didn't want to empower him. That's how I feel too. Uh, how does it feel to be a British resident in America? Well, I deeply love America and I feel like it's a very misunderstood country, funnily enough. It's where my whole career took off, really, where every opportunity I've had in my life has been offered to me f as an immigrant, ironically, in America. And I believe strongly in it, but I am heartbroken to see what's going on currently, you know. And we talk about it every day in every way. <laughs> I mean, it's it's changed our daily existence. You know, I, I didn't imagine I, I never imagined that having a leader that is like the creature we have in, currently in power would affect my daily existence in the way it, in the way he has. But yeah, every day in every way, I'm agitated. I'm angry. I'm upset. I feel fearful when you hear some of the rhetoric regarding like the LGBTQ community, for a random example, of, of which we have so many friends who we love and admire and and we feel our community's under threat. Mm. Uh, 
and our fans, you know, so many of our fans are from that community and to hear the rhetoric coming out of Mike Pence's mouth or is, is, sh- is so shocking to me mm. and that people are not out in the street going nuts at the white at the gates of the White House kind of shocks me too. Mm-hmm. It's like, what's it going to take before the American people will rise up? You know, mm. th- th- it, I, it, it sh- baffles me because it's hate speak. In terms of your day to day then, like... Oh, can we not just talk about something cheap and cheerful and superficial? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting really dark. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Um, tell me a bit. But can I? Can I? T- can you just tell me a little bit about girls' school in the yes. UK and the movement? What that is, and like how you've been involved with what they've been doing. Then, well, they're a phenomenal initiative out of uh, Los Angeles, run by a, an amazing musician called Anna Bulbrook, who's best known for working with the uh, Airborne Toxic event. And she uh, came up with this initiative, which is to encourage women of all ages, all ethnicities, all socioeconomic backgrounds to get involved in music at whatever level and area they want to get involved in, whether that's, you know, lighting, monitor engineering, production, so on and so forth, performing. And I was invited to be on her, her keynote speaker two years ago. And then she contacted me again this year. And I'd had such an amazing experience then the first year I was involved that I jumped at the chance and she suggested I do this incredible performance with an all-female choir, a string quartet, a harpist, a all-female band and it was extraordinary. It was an extraordinary, wonderful, magical event and I was very proud to be involved and the wonderful, amazing goddess that Fiona Apple came and joined me on stage and we sang a cover of... Uh, Leslie Gore's You Don't Own Me and Fiona was wearing a Neil Portnow t-shirt which she had handmade yeah and it was delightful and to to just be part of that protest in such beautiful poetic terms just felt really extraordinary Mm. that sounds like a very positive thing to be happening are there plans to uh, move it into different cities that lineup you just mentioned sounds like a really inspiring group of musicians to bring together take it on tour or something like that well i know anna bulbrook is an ambitious woman i'm sure she's got plans i have she's yet to share them with me but you know i'm also involved with the girls rock movement here in london mm-hmm. and in glasgow in miami and you know there's this a uh, uh, worldwide initiative that the girls rock campaign is this got the same ideas but they try and promote women and encourage them to get involved you know the statistics surrounding female musicians is shockingly low Mm. yeah I'm excited about that I feel like at least it feels like sort of you know action in some ways Mm. and yeah so it was a joy it's a joy to be involved in all that stuff you mentioned last night during your speech about festival lineups the fact that it's not acceptable that that there is not more women on festival lineups that people aren't booking more female artists for example, this year there's festivals taking place around Europe. There's one in Sweden that I know of that's like an all female festival. So the lineup will be female and the people going, they'll be female. What do you think about things like that? Well, you know, I used to not believe in positive discrimination at all. I was I was very against any form of what I considered to be a, like a ghetto. And I felt very strongly that women had to compete with men. But then I came to realise as I've gotten older, women aren't being given the opportunity to compete. So if they're not being allowed to compete, then sure, setting up all female-centric festivals or lineups or opportunities, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I feel very strongly that there has to be a no-tolerance policy, i.e. the punters shouldn't be going to festivals if they don't see themselves represented there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if you're not seeing yourself being represented don't go, don't give them your dollars, don't give them your pounds, Mm. boycott it. Because until you do that, they're just going to keep going along in their easy, breezy, patriarchal ways. Mm -hmm. And nothing's ever going to change, you know. So, yeah, I'm I'm sort of torn, but as I've gotten older, as I've said, I'm I'm for positive discrimination. It's the only way we can force their hand. I went to MIA's Meltdown Festival last year. It was fantastic. It was full of incredible female artists, including Maya herself. You're involved with the Sundance Festival this year, mm-hmm. um, and you've seen the MIA documentary. I have, yeah. Are you a fan of hers? Huge what, fan. And what did you make of the, the, the documentary? I love the documentary. I mean, I usually if I'm a fan of an artist and then I go and see a documentary, I can often be a little disappointed or bummed out. I loved her more than I did 
before, which I do think is a good sign. I mean, I just thought she was, I think she's spectacular on so, on so many fronts. Phenomenal filmmaker, by the way. Mm. Like, really, a, she's the, an incredible video maker. Like, mm. crazy good. And also has her own authentic, genuinely original voice in music. And that's rare. And then, it, and then she's got this delightful, sparkling personality. Mm. She has something to say. She's passionate. And she seems like a good person. You know, it's like she's trying to put something good out there as opposed to something negative. And uh, no, I couldn't love her more. I find her very inspiring. <laughs> Is that amongst the best um, documentaries that have focused on an artist that you've ever seen, do you think? No, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, okay. I think I, I, I always want more. You know, I mean, Dig to me is like maybe the best music documentary of all time. But there, are, I also thought um, the Metallica Gods and Monsters was so a piece good. of genius. I mean, there's so many great documentaries. Mm. And then it depends what you're looking for. Yeah. Mm. But I think they did a good job in that they portrayed her in a very positive light. I, I would have preferred more music, you know, focus. But, you know, hey, that's just me being fussy as usual. Would you ever do the Shirley Manson documentary or the garbage documentary film or write a book or any of those type of things? I don't know. I always say never say never, you know, like you just never know. I never thought in a million years we'd ever put out a coffee table book and we did. And it was, you know, very satisfying, I have to say, when when the, the whole thing was said and done. So, yeah, I never say no. I just think you should always keep your options open. Yeah. But am I working on a fucking documentary on myself right now no i'm not and do i have any plans to anytime soon no absolutely not okay well, <laughs> i i for one would like to see it <laughs> um, you're celebrating 20 years of version 2.0 you're gonna perform that album in its entirety yeah. basically is yeah. that the plan that is the plan and we're pretty excited about it we had such a great time on the first records anniversary 20th anniversary we, we didn't realize how much joy we'd get out of it some of the songs we hadn't even even listened to since we put them out in 95 you know so it was kind of uh exploratory exercise and and we loved it and the fans loved it we had such a blast and so yeah i think we're all like pretty excited about taking version 2.0 out on the road mm -hmm. um it's not a very long tour we're just doing maybe eight weeks in total which for us is really short um this year is mostly about writing. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But we keep getting distracted with a whole load of other nonsense, as you always do as a band. But um, the, the, that's the plan, is we're going to be working all year on writing and recording so that we have a new record to go out next year. But, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men, as they say. What kind of things still really pique your interest in terms of the, the music that you want to create, the projects you want to be involved in? What kind of things still really gets you excited? Because it sounds like you've still got a lot of fire to like give. Well, I'm a Viking, so I will always have fire. Um, yeah, I will always have fire to my bow, I think, um, or to my longship. But I am getting more and more serious about collaborating with other artists. I find it really inspiring. I didn't have the confidence to do it when I was younger. And now that I'm older, I'm a bit more comfortable with, with going in and writing in front of people I don't know and also negotiating space in, in a collaborative setting. So I am excited about that kind of thing. I, I just don't want to keep repeating the same old, same old, you know. I really am getting more and more interested in sonics and how to do stuff that you haven't ever done before. It's uncomfortable, but that to me is exciting. Mm -hmm. And and then I bore my band rel religiously at the moment about what I call high stakes, i.e. Look, <clears throat> we're not young. We've never been young, but we're even less young now. What is it that we need to say? And what is it we want to say? If we died, you know, in a year, what have we left on the plate, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's to me exciting. Because I like having restrictions. I feel like you can be really creative when you have really narrow confines in a funny way. And I feel like that to me is something I want to explore. My high stakes, whatever that may be, whatever it is for my band, I find that an interesting challenge. To how to talk about the things nobody really wants to talk about. Nobody wants to talk about age. Nobody wants to talk about death. Nobody wants to talk about these kind of things topics and that of course is like a red rag to a bull to me okay well I, I, I look forward with relish to hearing <laughs> what comes next
Midnight Chats is a loud and quiet podcast. Production by Emma Snook. Music courtesy of Gold Panda. Search Midnight Chats on iTunes for more episodes and to subscribe. For more information, visit loudandquiet.com.